Everyone can see that? Yeah, let's get started. Uh, so yeah, thank you for coming to this talk on uh, uh, learning to reflect. Um, and also thank you to Monzo for hosting uh, uh, this event. Um, so yeah, uh, before we get started with that, the other day I was actually browsing through our uh, company Slack um, and found that we used to have this old Slack channel called uh, Semaphore. Uh, and uh, as someone who's interested in locking systems, uh, it sounded intriguing. Uh, and reading more into it though, uh, the purpose of this channel was to coordinate access to 10 remote machines uh, that were used to power our customer operations in the past. Uh, so what would happen is a human would come into this channel, uh, declare a number, uh, and essentially lock access to that machine. Uh, the reason this needed to be done uh, was because uh, if someone else SSH'd into the machine and started running commands, uh, the previous person would get booted out. Uh, so if you're running something that was like long running uh, and you got booted out midway, uh, that isn't a very pleasant experience. So people were pretty fast in acquiring uh, these locks, but they weren't very judicious in releasing them. Uh, so at some point, you, you end up in a deadlock scenario uh, where you have all 10 locks uh, uh, acquired and no locks free to run your custom operation stuff. So this is something that we need to solve for. Uh, and yep, you guessed it. Uh, you know, we put in a Slack reminder, four in the morning, uh, auto release of all locks uh, via a, a Slack box reminder. Um, so, you know, if you cross the 4 a.m. boundary and you are still running your query, you better make sure that you, you, you acquire the lock again. Um, I just love this, uh, the chaos around this entire system, uh, but happily we've grown a lot and uh, gotten a lot more engineers uh, to, to actually fix this uh, properly and, and introduce better automation. And we've gotten rid of all of those 10 machines, which is really nice. So yeah, on to the main program. Uh, we're gonna spend the next 20 minutes uh, talking about uh, the Reflect package in Go um, and how to get started with that. A uh, bit of an introduction. Uh, my name is Sahel. Uh, I am a platform engineer uh, on the uh, platform squad at Monzo. Uh, the platform squad uh, builds the foundation so that engineers can ship their services without having to worry about all of the underlying infrastructure that, that operates their services. Uh, they don't have to worry about whether there's enough database space in the cluster or whether there's enough compute capacity in the, in the, in the cluster. Uh, most of the time, it involves debugging things like uh, Kubernetes and Cassandra and Go, uh, which is uh, why I'm here. Um, a uh, bit of an introduction for, uh, about Monzo, uh, apart from what Mar Marcelo has already said. Uh, we have 3 million plus customers. Uh, I have no idea, like we've just grown the additional 200,000 customers since I wrote, since I wrote this slide. Uh, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty great to see. Um, yeah, and we have oh, th this many customers who trust us with their money. Um, our mission is to make money work for you. Uh, we also have these really nice hot coral cards. Um, and if you haven't seen them, uh, definitely catch one of us uh, in the crowd and uh, we'll be happy to show you ours. Um, so yeah, why am I stood here talking about reflection? Um, it's no secret that uh, Monzo uses uh, Go for all of our microservices. Uh, we have 15, uh, we have 1,500 of them running in production right now to operate the bank. Uh, we love Go. Um, it's also no open secret that we use uh, uh, Cassandra uh, to store all of our stateful data. Um, and to marry the communication between uh, Go and Cassandra, uh, we use two libraries, uh, GoSQL and GoCasa. So the tale of this story starts in June. Um, I was profiling some of our microservices running in production uh, uh, using amazing, uh, the Golang's uh, amazing PPROF tooling and was seeing a general trend uh, where a lot of time was being spent uh, on marshalling data in our, in our, in our ORM layer. Um, here's one of the profiles on the, on the screen. Uh, you can see that a large proportion of time, uh, of CPU time is being spent uh, decoding into structs. Now, under the hood, uh, data would come from our Cassandra driver uh, as a single or a list of key value maps. Uh, you might have seen like map string interfaces uh, uh, before if you've worked with Go. Um, and what we wanted is that, uh, you know, engineers want to work with, uh, you know, uh, well-defined structs and, and, you know, to take advantage of things like, like typing and, and, you know, uh, struct access and stuff like that. Um, this sort of a marshalling shouldn't really be the biggest CPU hog uh, in, in our services. Uh, we saw so much CPU time being spent on, on, on things like these. And when we aggregated the metrics, we saw services which were using multiple CPU cores just to, just to process all of this data. So long story short, we did a deep dive and rewrote a lot of the decoding uh, using custom reflection uh, and ripped out a lot of the internals of the library under the hood uh, by leveraging uh, prior information about the types that were, were being defined. Uh, the end result was a big performance improvement uh, for some of our services. This service in particular, uh, which allows our customer operations to serve uh, all, of our, all of our wonderful customers uh, 
uh, with, with great support, uh, saw the, the latency drop from uh, 500 milliseconds in the P99 to just 25 milliseconds. Uh, the CPU usage just dropped significantly, uh, dropped to fractions of a core. And because this was a library level change, all of our microservices that use Cassandra could benefit uh, immediately without having to change a single line of code. I mean, uh, as engineers, like having someone else do the work and uh, for you to reap the benefits of speed improvements, that's what we live for, right? Um, if you're interested in a change itself, uh, all of this uh, library code is open source. Uh, we are also big proponents of open source. Uh, so the PR is up there. Um, go and have a look. Um, the slides are also already online. Um, and yeah, I'm sure they'll be shared afterwards. Um, so if you ask most folks uh, about, about the reflect package, uh, you might have come across the, the, this method, uh, deep equal, uh, which allows you to do a deep comparison of things like destructs or maps or, or lists. Um, you know, it's really useful if you're doing something like testing with, with asserting to see if, if two structs are, are functionally equivalent. Um, but the reflect package has uh, much more beyond that um, and has some pretty neat capabilities. And getting started with it is not very hard. So the remainder of this talk, uh, we'll go through this canonical example um, where we're essentially taking this piece of data um, that we might have received from a database or like, you know, as input um, and, you know, having a, and building a, a conversion uh, into a struct model, uh, which we can use in the rest of our program. Um, so yeah, we've got these, uh, we've got these uh, two structs defined, which map to various fields. Um, so we now need to write the function, which will take the, um, the map string interface data and assign all the fields into this user struct uh, and the corresponding user job struct for the embedded uh, map string interface. Now, if you are writing this function by hand, uh, you might do something like this, uh, where you will take every value in the map, check if it's present, do some type coercing uh, uh, to make sure that the compiler doesn't moan at you, um, and then assign it to the various fields in the struct. Uh, this is a little bit tedious to, if you're writing this by hand, uh, but luckily there are a lot of generators uh, which can write all of this tedious code for you. Um, but what if we wanted to use reflection? What if we didn't have the capability of changing the, the services? What if you're working at a different level of abstraction? So before we dive into that, let's talk about the, the laws of reflection in Go. Uh, there are three particular laws, and once you uh, get familiar with them, uh, understanding reflection gets a lot more easier. So law number one, uh, reflection is a, is a way to get from an interface value to a reflect object. What does this mean uh, concretely? Um, so when you call a particular method, like uh, reflect.typeof or reflect.valueof, the argument you pass in is taken in as an interface, uh, and what you get back is a, is a, is a struct, a reflect.type or a reflect.value, depending on what method you call. Law number two, uh, reflection goes back from the reflect object back to an interface value. Uh, so essentially, it's the inverse of law one. So in this particular example, we can coerce n uh, n being the name, actually, uh, uh, you know, into a, a reflect object. Uh, so at that point, uh, v is going to be a reflect.value, uh, and then coerce it back by calling the interface method back into a string. The third and final law uh, is that if we want to modify a reflect object, uh, its value must be settable. Uh, this law is pretty important to understand, um, and it's the one that trips most people up and leads to bugs and unintended behavior. What does settable mean in practice, though? Uh, so this example looks uh, perfectly, uh, perfectly reasonable. Uh, we're taking a value, we're coercing it into a reflect value, uh, we're setting it uh, a string value, so we're changing from my name to, to Binga, um, and then we're trying to print this name. Um, and you know, uh, the reflect method has a particular method set string, uh, which will change the underlying value. This, this looks like it would work, uh, but when you actually run it, you get a very nice panic. Uh, uh, which says that a thing, uh, this particular value must be assignable. Um, and uh, the reason for that is the, the reflect package doesn't work with values. You, know, you've got to, you can't beat the laws of Go. You have to do by pointer, essentially, uh, rather than by value. I, I'm not able to change this assignment at runtime. Um, yeah, so essentially I was passing name by value. Uh, so you're essentially passing a copy of the string to hell. You're not passing the address of the string cell so that it can change it under the hood. Uh, this wouldn't be settable if you are writing normal Go. Uh, with reflection, uh, there is no special exemption from that. To make this work, you need to send a pointer to set string uh, and to the reflector value uh, and have it point to a memory address that you can change and you can change the storage under the hood. So note the addition of the ampersand uh, to send a pointer to name. 
uh, rather than the raw string value uh, and the changes in uh, setting the actual element uh, under the pointer rather than the actual value itself. So yeah, once I've done that, I get the expected value and I can change my name to Binga. Uh, yeah. So now we're about the law. Uh, we know about the laws. Uh, let's go back to our user example. Uh, so notice that how I kept all of the struct fields as public. Uh, there are no private fields. Um, if we had kept them private, the reflect package can't do any magic and see what they are under the hood. So the reflect package can't beat the laws of Go. Uh, you've got to keep these struct fields public so that the, the reflect package can access them and set them uh, if you ask it to. Um, you can't bypass the, the attributes of the Go programming language. So we need to write an unmarshal method uh, which can use reflection. Uh, it is a layer of indirection, but it will al allow us to unmarshal any map into any struct. So let's make sure that we've got, a, we're gonna start with some quick validation, make sure that we've got a, a pointer, uh, and then it's a pointer to a struct. Uh, so to do this, we can use the reflect, uh, the kind method uh, in, in the reflect package to make sure that we've got these, uh, we've got a pointer and a struct. Now, to do the actual assignment, uh, we can loop through all of the fields in the struct. So with the reflect package, you can call uh, struct fields and, and stuff like that, uh, which will give you all of the all of the data back, all of the fields that are public within the within the struct. Um, and then what we can do is we can coerce them into lowercase and set them from values uh, from our map. Now, of course, there are many edge cases around this. If you're writing actual unmarshaling code, you might want it to be much more robust. But but for this simple example, uh, this would work. Um, we do, there is some funny work going on around uh, uh, iterating over a numerical struct fields. Uh, this is so you can uh, support things like embedded structs. Um, but yeah, uh, if, you're, if you're more interested in that, check out the Go docs for the reflect. Oh, blank slide. No idea why that's there. Um, but yeah, <laughs> this naive version uh, will work for most of the fields. Uh, but for the job field, uh, it will try and set a map string interface uh, for the user job uh, struct, and that's no good if we if we retain our naive version because you can't coerce a map string interface into a struct, uh, so that will essentially cause a panic uh, uh, if we don't handle that mismatch in types. So handling that requires a ton more code, um, and I've put all of the code that I used for this uh, on on the GitHub link there. Um, and if you're interested in in how I actually get it to to create a, a pointer dynamically uh, and set all of the fields, uh, you can definitely go check out that code. It's like more than 50 lines uh, and it's got tests. Uh, yeah, so visit the URL and it has, uh, or you can look at it in your own leisure. Um, reflection is quite powerful in Go, uh, but it does come at a cost. Uh, firstly, all of the great uh, compile time checking and validation that makes Golang uh, really, really nice is practically thrown out the window. Uh, so with reflection, you only get to know uh, if your program is buggy uh, at runtime uh, when you get one of these messages, uh, a panic uh, whilst your program is running. Um, so while you're developing, especially, uh, get, you get pretty used to seeing uh, panics like these uh, whilst, you're, whilst you're debugging. Um, I would strongly recommend if you're writing a reflection code, uh, have a strong test suite to make sure that you don't introduce any regressions as you're iterating. Um, also, reflection can be uh, much slower than writing uh, your code by hand. So for our test program, I wrote a very crude benchmark, uh, which would iterate over the same map over and over again. Um, and the hand-rolled version, uh, the one where I was uh, checking for each field in the map string interface and setting the appropriate value in the struct, was an order of magnitude faster. Uh, Go can't be smart when you're using reflection about uh, where it allocates uh, memory, you know, whether it's on the stack or the heap or uh, applying clever compiler time optimizations. Uh, it's got to do everything at runtime. Um, don't read too much into this benchmark though, uh, because there are definitely some optimizations we can make on the, on the reflection side. Um, but yeah, constantly running a reflection on a struct which is going to be static uh, is going to be very costly and you can definitely apply some optimizations to get that number down. But it is going to be slower than the hand rolled version. Um, we've covered a few uh, functions in the reflect package in this talk, uh, but there are a, a whole bunch of others which would allow you to uh, inspect structs, uh, set maps, uh, set elements of maps uh, without knowing anything about the underlying uh, storage under the hood. You can see whether a particular uh, type can be coerced into another type or whether a particular field is assignable. Um, get struct tags, so if you've worked with the JSON uh, 
dot marshal, uh, JSON marshaling and unmarshaling. Uh, you might wonder how the struct tags work, where you can set the set the fields uh, that it will decode in, uh, it will decode from. Uh, that all works with struct tags, and that all works by the reflect package. So yeah, definitely check out the Go docs on the reflect package at the link over there, uh, as all the properties are really well documented. And that's about it. Uh, and thank you to everyone hosting London Gophers. Yeah, sure. Um, we do have some time for questions. Questions? Oh, everyone's shy tonight. Oh, hang on, there's one in the front row. I, I, if I understood the talk correctly, you, you kind of showed us how to implement the, the map structure package. Um, and at the start, with your sort of performance analysis, you were showing that map structure was taking a lot of processor time. Yep. Um, and the JSON and YAML parsers in um, go work in a fairly similar way using reflection. Yep. Um, I'm just wondering whether you think um, optimizing reflection is the best way to do parsing. Or whether you think we should be doing code generation or something like that. Yeah, that is that, no, that is that is definitely a very good point. Um, I would definitely say that you know if you can do code generation, uh, then that is far more preferable. And that's why I put the benchmark up there because the hand rolled version, no, no matter how much you optimize the reflection, the charts that I showed was just optimizing for reflection. Uh, but if you could do code generation, it's going to be an order of magnitude faster all the time, hands down, and you get a lot more uh, compile time uh, benefits uh, along with it. Um, for us, uh, when we did those particular optimizations, we didn't want to change over 500 plus services uh, to add that code generation in. That would have been uh, quite difficult uh, for us. So we made a change at the library level um, by optimizing the reflection that was under the hood. Um, but yes, definitely, if you can do code generation, then do code generation. No more Any questions. Any other questions? Brilliant. No? You're all done. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Oh, great.